Welcome to Westview, where life change happens. In our upcoming sermon series, called Signs and Wonders, we will be exploring selected miracles of Jesus in their historical and theological context. For each miracle, we'll discuss not only how past witnesses would have understood the events, but also how we can draw meaning from Jesus' words and actions today. From giving sight to the blind to enabling a paralyzed man to walk, from raising a dead girl back to life to walking on water and stilling the storm, from the feeding of the multitudes to resurrecting Lazarus. Join us on Sundays from the 7th of April to the 12th of May to hear what God might be saying to you through these miraculous acts of Christ. Invite a friend or a family member. See you there. Marriage prep begins from the 16th of April to the 21st of May. It's going to be in the Infant Chapel on Tuesdays from 7 to 9 p.m. Just remember, on the 23rd of April, there is no marriage prep. For more information, please contact our office. On the 14th of April, we invite you to join us for our first community worship service for the year. Bring the kids, family and friends for a meaningful time of worship. We also invite you to stay after the service for a cup of tea or coffee. Please follow us on our Facebook, TikTok and Instagram pages or visit our website at www.westview.org.za. But don't keep us a secret, share our content with your friends and family. Christ is risen, Christ is risen indeed. Friends, allow me to welcome you to our Easter and our resurrection service. We trust and we pray that you would encounter and experience the living and the loving Christ. As we raise our hallelujahs, as we raise our praise and our adoration towards God, let's join in the call to worship. Those words that appear in bold, please respond with. Where shattered hearts are made whole, where wounded souls are healed, where life is stronger than death, there the stone has been rolled away. Where the lonely become our friends, where a stranger is welcomed home, where hope is stronger than despair, there we find Jesus walking. Where selfishness is changed to generosity, where the anxious find serenity, where love is stronger than hate, there Jesus is opening our eyes. The stone has been rolled away. Jesus is our companion on the journey. Our eyes are open to the needs of others. Hallelujah, Christ is risen. Hallelujah, Christ is with us. Amen. And so we invite you to continue to worship God in song and in praise together with us. May you enjoy the song. Thine be the glory risen conquering sun endless is the victory thou art yet has won angels in bright raiment rolled the stone away kept the folded grave clothes where thy body Meets us, risen. 
distant from the two. Lovingly He greets us, scatters fear and gloom. Let the church with gladness, hymns of triumph sing. For the Lord now liveth, death hath lost its sting. Thy be the glory, risen, conquering Son. Endless is the victory, Thou, O death, hast won. And because He God, it's strange that today the world doesn't look all that different. We would have expected things to have changed, for everything to be somehow brighter, more vibrant, more alive. But that's not really how resurrection works, is it, God? Today you ask us to see differently, to look beyond our unchanged world, to look past everything that seems so much the same, and see the life that pulses through it all, that has always been there, hidden, yet present. And when we allow you to open our eyes and hearts, we discover that resurrection isn't so much something that happens around us, but something that happens within us, something that changes us and how we live in this ordinary, unchanged world. And so we celebrate your abundant, vibrant, unquenchable life that is within us and in all things even now, that changes us and empowers us and inspires us to live fully and freely. Forgive us when we become blind to your life, when we forget that death is not the final word, and when we settle for less than the vibrant, creative life you want for us. Thank you that your life never stops working within us and through us. And thank you for this day, which reminds us that death always leads to new life. Amen. Friends, on this Easter Sunday, we celebrate and give thanks for God's gift of life. And we remember that everything we have and are is a gift of grace. And so now... As an act of worship, thanksgiving, faith, and commitment to God's life, we bring our gifts. If you've already given in another way, thank you. But if you want to give as part of your worship today, Westview's banking details are on screen now and will appear again at the end of the service. Let's give generously and gratefully as resurrection people, sharing God's resurrection life with others through our offering. As we have come bringing our times, our treasure, and our talents to the work and the will of God, I'm going to invite you to join with me in prayer as we bless the resources to God's kingdom. And so, Lord, as we have come to give not only our financial ability and resources, Lord, we remember that offertory is so much more than that. Offertory is about giving ourselves wholeheartedly to your kingdom and to your will. We pray, Lord, in this moment as we have come to give that which we can, not that which we have to. We pray, Lord, that you would stretch and multiply the resources that we have laid at your disposal. That in the same way, Lord, that you took those loaves and those fish to feed the multitudes. We pray, Lord, that you would multiply and stretch what we give to your hands because we remember that you are a miracle working God. Lord, we pray for these resources to be used with wisdom and discernment through Westview Methodist Church. 
Lord, may the leadership and those entrusted with these resources know where they need to be allocated, how they need to be allocated, and why they need to be used in that specific way. Father, we pray that we would remember that mission and ministry always needs funds and resources. Lord, that we would be accountable, but also, Lord, that we would be transparent in how we use what we have been given. So, Father, bless these resources. Use them for your kingdom, for your glorification, and for your adoration. That through it all, Jesus, you may be made known and revealed to those who need you the most. Father, we pray these things in the Christ, in the name of Christ, who is our giver, who is our gift, and who is our God. In his name we do pray. Amen. Good morning, everybody. Our reading today is taken from Mark chapter 16, verses 1 to 14. Jesus has risen. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb and they asked each other, Who will roll away the stone from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him? But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. When Jesus rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had driven seven demons. She went and told those who had been with him and who were mourning and weeping. When they heard that Jesus was alive and that she had seen him, they did not believe it. Afterward, Jesus appeared in a different form to two of them while they were walking in the country. These returned and reported it to the rest, but they did not believe them either. Later, Jesus appeared to the eleven as they were eating. He rebuked them for their lack of faith and their stubborn refusal to believe those who had seen him after he had risen. We give thanks for this reading from God's Word today. Amen. On this Easter and Resurrection Sunday and service, I want to be speaking to you from the theme entitled, Risking Failure to Provide Proof of Life. For those of you who don't know, I'm a big and an avid movie fan. Oftentimes when I originally moved to Centurion, I would make it a habit and a ritual of mine in my free time to go to Mall at Reds and sit in the theater all on my own and enjoy a good movie in peace and in silence. Those movies that I enjoyed watching was John Wick 4. Another movie that I thoroughly enjoyed was The Equalizer 3. To extend that, I'm also a big fan of the Godfather series, Godfather 1, Godfather 2, not so much Godfather 3. And even though these movies might not be so sanctified and holy, they are somewhat my guilty pleasure. And yet there's one movie that I lift up as one of my all-time favorite movies, a movie that was created and aired in 1994. This was a movie that grossed more than $660 million, a movie that received the Academy Award for the best film of the year, and the lead actor Tom Hanks received the Academy Award for the best actor of the year. Friends, with Tom Hanks being mentioned, you should know this movie. It's called Forrest Gump. You know a movie is memorable when after watching the movie, you are able to quote some memorable lines as if you were experiencing and watching the movie for the first time all over again. 
For those of us who remember Forrest Gump, some of those memorable quotes and lines were something like, stupid is as stupid does. And if you remember the words and the lines that Forrest Gump lifted up from the mouth and the mind of his mama, I want to remind you that there are some gospel undertones to some of the quotes and the words that he shared with us in that movie. You would remember Forrest Gump said that in order to move forward in life, you have to put your past behind you. That's gospel good news. You would remember Forrest Gump would say that unfortunately death is simply a part of life. That might not be good news, but there's some gospel in that. And then the most memorable quote from, the, from all of Forrest Gump's movie is the following. That life is like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. That friends, sometimes life and sometimes the reality of walking with God is that when we put our hands in the box of life, we are met with some unpleasant surprises and some unpleasantries. That sometimes God allows some things on our doorstep that we would rather not choose to come in our direction. And yet the way of God and the way of the gospel is that when we find ourselves with some things in the box of life that we don't like, it is only simply proper and good etiquette to go all the way through that thing instead of shoving it and throwing it back in the box. And friends, yet, for those of us who have experienced the unpleasantries and the unpleasant surprises of life, the declaration and the proclamation on this Easter Sunday is that God is able to transform and change those unpleasant surprises into something that becomes a pleasant surprise. Can I preach to someone right here, right at the beginning of this sermon? That God is a God who is able to take the ugly and turn it into beautiful. That God is able to transform death into life. That God is able to change brokenness into blessedness. And yet, allow me to take you back into antiquity. Those women and those disciples who have journeyed with Jesus towards the cross and the tomb have experienced nothing but unpleasant surprises for the last 36 hours before the Sabbath arrives. Friends, can I remind you of the unpleasant surprises? Jesus being arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane. Unpleasant surprise. Them being discarded and being betrayed by their friend Judas. Unpleasant surprise. Jesus, Jesus being condemned to death even though Pilate knew that he was innocent. Unpleasant surprise. Jesus being beaten to a breath of his life. Unpleasant surprise. Jesus carrying the cross beam up the hillside of Calvary to be crucified. Unpleasant surprise. Jesus hanging with two nails in his hands and the cross beam in his feet. Unpleasant surprise. Jesus crying out, it is finished and Father into your hands I commit my spirit. Unpleasant surprise. And so when these three women, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome go to the tomb on, on the Sabbath or on the first day of the week, they have one question on their mind after all of the unpleasantries that they have experienced and encountered. They ask who is going to roll the stone away for us so that we can participate in the Jewish ritual and custom of anointing the dead body of Jesus. That's an interesting question to ask. Because some scholars suggest that the stone that was rolled in front of the tomb was not only there to keep Jesus from coming out, but it was also there to prevent people from going in. This stone, which weighed approximately one ton, over 900 kilograms, was what prevented these women from getting into the tomb to anoint their crucified Savior, Jesus Christ. And so as they get to the tomb, they remember that life sometimes has a way of putting us in a place where we, when we connect our relationships with our resources and with our abilities, we sometimes still come up short. And yet the sunrise surprise of Easter Sunday is that when they get to the tomb, everything that they had worried about had already been dealt by with God. Friends, have you ever been so concerned about the stones that stood in your way only for you to arrive at that point and that place in life to recognize and realize that God had already dealt with everything that you were worried and concerned about? You were worried about what they were going to say, but God already shut your enemies' mouths up. You were worried about how you were going to make it through the end of the month only for a good and a generous Samaritan to give you the resources to make it through the month. Friends, the sunrise surprise of Easter Sunday is that even in the midst of the unpleasantries, God moves ahead of us, moves the stones as a reminder that God is already dealing with what we're struggling with. And the saddest thing about those saints in Christ who live with a non-expectation of God,
is that you've seen God move stones in the past, but you refuse to live with an expectation that God can do it in the future. If God has moved stones of prayer and through prayer in your past, what makes you think that God can't do it now? If God has moved lying lips in the past, what makes you think God can't do it now? If God has moved financial burdens and crises in the past, what makes you think God can't do it now? They're pleasantly surprised to find that the stone has been rolled away. And secondly, they are surprised that when they get to the tomb, they are encountered by a man dressed in a white robe who tells them that Jesus is no longer in the tomb. He has been risen. Now they're hesitant, understandably at first, because how is it possible for a Jewish messianic figure to be resurrected from the dead long before the end time resurrection? It's interesting. Because the stone was there to keep the woman out, but the stone was also there to keep Jesus in. Can I give you an illustration? Being a, a minister, one of the parts of the work that I do is hospital visitation. Friends, I've become so accustomed to the acronyms at hospital that I already know what PICU means. I know what NICU means. I know what ICU means. I know what CICU means. And I also know what oncology means. And yet when I was in Kruenstadt, I visited a woman who was in a ward where she was beginning to grow tired of being in the same bed, in the same room for as long as she was in. And friends, as she spoke to me, she said to me that she had signed a form called an AMA, something I'd never heard about. And she told me that this is a form that you sign against medical advice. That the doctors want her to stay there. The nurses try to encourage and convince her to remain in bed. And even those psychiatric people who walk, work as therapists try to remind her that she needs to stay put. And yet she signed an AMA form to say that against the advice of medical and doctor advice, she's going to go out of there. Friends, can I tell you about the good news of Easter Sunday? That when everything tried to tell Jesus to remain in the tomb, when the devil tried to keep him locked in, when death tried to lock, go, let him go, when the grave tried to keep him enclosed in the tomb, Jesus said, I've signed a form that goes against all of your advice and I'm walking right out of here. They are pleasantly surprised by the stone and the body that is no longer present and yet this is a God who takes great risk to provide proof of life because if we read on in Mark's gospel chapter 16 the question that I ask is why does Jesus not stay at the tomb to meet all three women to give them proof that he is alive come back with me to that Sunday the sun is about to rise they're about to anoint the dead body of Jesus when they get there they are met by an empty tomb Friends, they don't know where the body of Jesus is. They don't know if he's been resurrected, but they know that the body isn't there. So they run to Peter and them. Peter and them get word of this. And in the other gospel accounts, Peter and John run to the tomb. John outruns Peter. Peter comes in afterwards. They look into the tomb and recognize the grave clothes that have been folded up. They don't know if Jesus is resurrected, but they know that the body isn't there. The soldiers wake up and they look into the tomb and they recognize that they don't know what happened to Jesus, but the body isn't there. Caiaphas, the high priest, gets word that the body has gone missing. And he begins to concoct a plan to remind the people that the body was stolen. And all that they know was that the body was not there. Friends, the body is not there. But that is not sufficient enough for the disciples to know that Jesus is resurrected. The question is, how does Jesus provide proof of life? So that the disciples can know without a shadow of a doubt that Jesus is resurrected. It is one thing to know that the body is not there, but it's a completely different thing to lay eyes on the resurrected Jesus himself. And friends, isn't this where the paradox comes into play? That there is discrepancy and disagreement among the Gospels. Luke says that there were certain women who came to the tomb. Mark that we've read about says that there's Mary, the mother of James, Salome and Mary Magdalene. Luke says that it's Mary and the other Mary Magdalene. John only says that it's Mary Magdalene who comes to the tomb. So despite the discrepancy and the disagreement, we can agree on authorial consensus that Mary Magdalene is the only woman who was definitely at the tomb. Why is that important? Because if you're a Bible reader, Mary Magdalene is the prime candidate to anoint the dead body of Jesus. If you would remember, Mary Magdalene was the one with the expensive alabaster, alabaster box, fragrant perfume, wiping of Jesus' feet with her hair and cleansing them with her tears. If anyone 
could anoint the body of Jesus, it must have been Mary Magdalene. The question then is, if Jesus is going to go meet them in Galilee and go ahead of them, what are the ways that Christ provides proof of life for the disciples and for us today? I want to leave you with three points about how we know that Christ is resurrected and present in our everyday life now, so that we don't have to live with doubt about the resurrected Jesus. The first point is that Jesus reveals His resurrection through the witness of other people. Now what's interesting is that Jesus first appears to Mary Magdalene and makes her and gives her the assignment to run to His disciples and tell them that He's alive. If you go read John chapter 20, this is how the encounter it goes down. Jesus appears to Mary Magdalene. She tries to touch Him and He says, no, you can't touch me yet. I have not yet ascended to my Father. What I need you to do, Mary, the assignment that I've got for you is go to the disciples and Peter and them and remind them that I've been resurrected as I told them that I would be. Now, what's interesting here is that for those of us who are sanctified sexist and those of us who have misguided misogyny, can I remind you that Jesus does not appear to Peter first. He does not appear to John first. He does not appear to James first. He does not appear to Matthew first. No, he appears to a woman. And so for those of us who try to reiterate that old lie about women remaining silent in church and not having authority over men, can I remind you that God chooses the witness of a woman in order to proclaim the resurrection of Jesus. That Peter, James and John and Matthew would not have believed that Christ was alive if Mary had not opened her mouth. So for any woman watching the service, can I remind you that if you know that Jesus is alive and living within you, never, ever, ever shut your mouth about who God is and how good God has been to you. Now, in Jewish culture, women were not allowed to witness in a court of law. Jewish culture held up the lie that women were too emotional to be rational. Maybe this is why Peter and them refused to believe the testimony of Mary Magdalene. But if you go read the text properly in Mark chapter 16, this is not just any woman. This is Mary Magdalene, whom Jesus had freed from seven demons. This is a woman who had been touched and transformed by the life and the presence of Jesus. In actual fact, I would argue that Christ has done more for Mary Magdalene than for Peter. Peter only had his name changed, but Mary Magdalene had her life changed. Friends, can I tell you how we know that Jesus is resurrected and alive? It comes through the witness of a changed life. Friends, when you don't have the desires that you used to have anymore because Jesus now sits on the throne of your heart, Christ is risen. When you no longer run with the people that you used to run with, Christ is risen. When you no longer hang out in the places that you used to hang out, Christ is risen. Can I tell you how I know beyond a shadow of a doubt and beyond debate that Christ is risen? Because there's some people watching the sermon who used to be a former so-and-so. Some of you are watching who used to be an ex this or that. Some of you are watching who used to hang out with this crowd, but you now hang out with this crowd. Some of you are watching and you say, no, thank you. That's not me anymore because Christ has touched and transformed my life. Friends, through the witness of other people, we know that Christ has been risen. Can I give you the second W? Because when the witness of Mary Magdalene comes to the disciples, they still refuse to believe her. So Jesus ups his game and says, not only through the witness, but now I'm going to bring it through the word that he's fulfilled. Remember that after he encounters Mary Magdalene, he then experiences and encounters two people who are walking in the countryside. If you go read Luke chapter 24, you would know that these are the two disciples who are walking to Emmaus. And as Jesus encounters them, and as he, and as he encounters them in a different form, he begins to open up the scriptures and give them a Bible study. And the text says in Luke chapter 24, all the way from Moses, which is Genesis, to the end of the Old Testament. In other words, Jesus opens up the word and shows them how the resurrection is the fulfillment of all of the promises that God has made throughout the Old Testament. Can I tell you what Jesus takes him through? Jesus takes him through Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers and Deuteronomy. Jesus takes him through Joshua, Judges and Ruth. God takes them through 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel, 1 Kings and 2 Kings, 1 and 2 Chronicles. God takes them through Isaiah and Jeremiah, through Lamentations, through Ezekiel. 
God takes them through Daniel. God takes them through Psalms and Proverbs. God takes them through Obadiah, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Zechariah, Malachi, and Haggai. Read your Bible and you would recognize that Jesus takes them through the entirety of the Old Testament, 39 books in total, to show how the Word has been fulfilled in Him. Why is this important? Because Jesus creates a connection and a correlation between His resurrection and the fulfillment of God's Word. Why is that important? Because if God is able to raise Jesus from the dead, that means that God is able to keep the promises that God has made to you. If Jesus is resurrected from the dead, then God can take you through the valley of the shadow of death. If Christ is alive, God can make weeping endure only for a night, but for joy to come in the morning. If Christ is alive, it means that weapons formed against you shall not prosper. But that means that the inverse is also true. That whenever a word of God is fulfilled and completed in your life, it's an opportunity and a moment for us to say thank you to Jesus. Friends, when words are fulfilled in your life, it is no coincidence. It is not by chance. It is not by happenstance. It is because Christ is living and His presence is at work in your life. So the next time you go to church and God has been good to you, no, 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 God has been mighty good to you, don't you sit there and cross your arms and sit like a bump on a log. Instead, may you sit in your place and continue to praise and glorify God because His Word has been fulfilled in your life. Then the last and the third point is that they don't believe on the basis of the witness of Mary Magdalene. Go read Mark chapter 16 again. They don't believe on the basis of the word that Jesus has fulfilled and opened to those walking to Emmaus. But lastly, watch this. Jesus is revealed in the presence of their worship. Not only the witness and the word, but in the presence of the worship of the disciples. Watch the progression of the text. The disciples have gathered together. Jesus appears in their midst wherever they are gathered. Don't miss this. Where they have gathered, Jesus appears in their midst and they remember to worship the living Christ. That friends, worship happens whenever we are gathered in one place together and Jesus' presence and peace touches our lives. Why is this important? Because we live in a generation that has no re holy reverence for what this is. Friends, we live in a generation where we have to convince ourselves to go to worship. We live in a generation where when it's sunny outside, we convince ourselves that we can't be inside church because we need to be spending the day outside. When it's raining, we convince ourselves that we can't go to church because it's too inconvenient. We convince ourselves we can't go to church because our band is not playing and our preacher is not preaching. We convince ourselves that we don't need to go to church because we went to church last Sunday. Friends, can I remind you that worship and the presence and the power of God does not start when you get there. No, no, worship is initiated when Jesus appears in our presence. That friends, you cannot be a Christian who is rooted in the resurrected life of Jesus if you are not consistently participating in worship. So watch what they do. When they encounter Jesus on Sunday, as good Jews, they would have worshipped and praised God on the Sabbath, which would have been from sundown Friday to sundown Saturday. But because they encountered Jesus in worship on Sunday, they changed the day of worship from the Sabbath in Jewish custom to the Sunday because they remember that on the Sunday they encountered the resurrected Jesus. Friends, can I tell you, for those of us who are Easter Christians, that Resurrection Sunday is not just one public holiday that we encounter once a year. Easter Sunday is not just 40 days after Ash Wednesday. No, no, when the church gathered every Sunday, they proclaimed the resurrection and the living Jesus. So if you're an Easter Christian who only comes to, Chris, Chris, or comes to church on Easter Sunday, can I remind you that the church will be here next Sunday to proclaim the resurrection of Jesus once again. Easter Sunday has only begun on this Sunday and will continue throughout the year. Friends, true Christians who gather in worship to encounter God and His resurrection, remember that every Sunday the resurrection of Jesus is encountered and experienced. And so friends, if you want to know how Jesus is alive, look at the witness of a life that has been changed. Look at the word of God that has been fulfilled in your life. And lastly, look at the showing up of God's presence and peace to a people like us in worship. How are you willing to prepare 
your heart and your mind to encounter the living Christ in witness, in word, and in worship. Friends, I trust and I pray that the sermon has given you something to think about and possibly given you a new slant on the very resurrection of Jesus. May God bless you, may God anoint you, and may you be protected by the power of God. Amen. Friends, let's welcome God's resurrection life into our lives a little more by taking a moment now for meditation and stillness. You may want to center yourself, close your eyes and deepen your breathing. And now focus on the air being drawn in and out of your body. Feel your body receiving life from the air you breathe. Feel your heartbeat and be aware of the blood pulsing through your veins. Feel your muscles and how they expand and contract as you move. Take a few moments to become deeply aware of the life that is at work within you. And now turn your focus outward. Listen for sounds of birds, insects and animals, of wind and of water. Become aware of all the life that is happening outside of the space where you are. Take a few moments to open to the greater life that fills the universe and give thanks for it. And now let's celebrate God's life within us, around us, and in all things as we sing. In the darkness we were waiting, without hope, without light, till from heaven you came right, there was mercy in your eyes, to fulfill the law and prophets, to avert came the word, from the throne of endless glory, to Shall not kneel and shall not faint by you. 
his blood and in his name it is freedom i am free for the love of jesus christ who has resurrected me Now as we come to the end of this time of worship, let's share God's life with one another as we share the words of the grace. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. And now let's go into this week in the power of resurrection to live fully and freely and share life with everyone we can. Thank you for sharing this time. Have a vibrantly alive week and God bless you.